Let's, uh, let's get into Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. So, um, you know, recently, uh, when uh, last month, uh, our family, we took the, a road trip up to Colorado and uh, up to uh, Silverthorne, Colorado, and it was a two-day trip with a six-year-old and a three-year-old now. And um, we didn't want them to be on the, the screens all the time, although there was time for that as well. But if you've been on a road trip with any kids, any parents in here have ever been on a road trip, there's one specific question, typically more than any other, that gets uh, asked, maybe other than, I'm hungry. But the one question that you get asked over and over and over and over and over and over and over is what? Yeah, it's funny. I didn't even have, you know, see, you know, if you have kids, you know. It's like this innate thing in us, right, uh, in our kids, just to ask, are we there yet, right? You know, I, I think, and, it's, and again, it won't just be asked once. It won't be just by one kid, but it'll be over and over to a point where you either want to pull your hair out or leave one of them on the side of the road and say, you, when you get here, we'll be waiting for you, you know. Now, um, or how many of you parents have you ever had a kid I'm sure you have, ask for something, maybe like ice cream or whatever it may be, a cookie or something, and they don't just ask one time, right? They ask over and over, hey, mom, can I have a cookie? And over, mom, can I have a cookie? No. Mom, can I have a cookie? No. And they just ask it over and over and over, kind of like that little finger that just kind of pokes you, right, and stabs you until what happens? Finally, you cave and you give them what they want, and they get that little whoo. They get that look on their face, you know. You, we all know. If you've had kids, you've seen it. They walk away with that face like, yes, I got it. Well, why do kids do this? Why do kids ask and pester their parents for things? Why is it? Why, why do kids do that? What? Because, we'll okay, maybe cause some of us will cave. Okay, why else? They, want it. they really want it, right? They really want that thing, and so they're going to keep poking. Why else? Maybe they're testing boundaries, okay? They want to see if they can, see if they can maybe get something. Maybe they know they shouldn't, but they're going to see what they can, okay? Ah, okay. They know maybe that you love them. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. And they're master manipulators. They know you love them, right? But, like, in a sense, but kids ask that often. Why? Because they feel safe about asking, do they not? Now, notice, they don't ask, they don't pester and ask the person that's not safe to ask that they don't feel that they can do that, Right? They only do it with those, I mean, but, and you know what, maybe, maybe, and this is, I think we forget sometimes with our kids, when they're three or they're six, and whatever it may be, they do have a felt need, right? They have something that's true in their mind. It, we may see it as something so small, something that's not so great, but in their mind, it's a felt need, right? I need this cookie right now. I need to go over to my friend's house, whatever it is. And they're asking. But they feel safe in asking you because, one, hopefully, if you're a decent parent, you love them, right? And you do. I mean, if you think about it, like, you ever thought about this in the passage today? I don't know if you noticed it as he, uh, Al was reading it. Have you ever thought about the fact in today's passage that Jesus asks us to be like our kids in the sheer persistence and pestering when it comes to prayer to our Heavenly Father? Have you ever noticed that? It always baffles me a little bit. This is one of those many, one of many passages we're going to look at in Luke that Jesus kind of tells a parable and he talks about this is how you approach God and you go, really? That seems like a kind of a, a weird way of coming to God. But if you think about it, if there's anybody that's good or knows how to pray properly, it would be who? Jesus. Now think about it. If you look just in the book of Luke so far, and this may not even be all the places. I just thought about it before. And when Jesus, we see often Jesus was doing what before great events? He was praying, right? Look at in verse 3, 21. He was praying right before the Holy Spirit came and descended upon him in his baptism, right? The, the Spirit came down like a dove. When his, before his ministry and his, he began, before Satan came and tempted him, what was he doing for 40 days? Prayer and fasting, right? In chapter 5, we see that off, it says often he withdrew to the wilderness to pray, to get away from everything. He was out praying. Before he chose the 12 to come and follow him in chapter 6, he spent all night in prayer, right? Before he did that, before he asked him. Before he comes to Peter and he says to him, Peter, who do people say that I am? And he turns it on Peter and he says, but who do you say that I am? It says that he was involved in prayer and he kind of came out of prayer and asked that question directly there. Not only that, but before his transfiguration, before he brought his three, Peter, James, and John, up to the mountain to, uh, to transfigure and to show something for him to talk to God, 
He was in prayer. And before today's text that we see in verse 1, it says, now Jesus was praying in a certain place. If there's one thing that's true about Jesus is that he was one that understood prayer. He was somebody that understood of how to speak to his heavenly father, how to approach him. And it's interesting, if you look, one of his disciples come to him and they say, teacher, what must I, or sorry, a teacher, when he stopped, one of his disciples says, Lord, sorry, I, was in, I, I jumped over the other one. Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Why do you think the disciples, one of these disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray? Why do you think that is? They saw him doing it. I heard somebody say something about learning, someone over here. Maybe they wanted to learn, right? There was something different about the way that Jesus prayed, right? It seems to be. Maybe there's something different. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's effort. Maybe it's the the things that he prayed about. I'm sure that they were close enough when they hear him pray. And they're like, something is different about this. Jesus, we need to learn from you what it means to pray. What does it look like? Teach us how to do what you do, Jesus. And what I want to do today is I want to show you kind of four things that Jesus says about prayer, what our prayer should look like. And I'll say this, this is not an exhaustive list. Obviously, this is 11 verses on prayer. It's not everything about prayer. It doesn't tell us all of the details or what we ask for or whatever it may be. But he gives us four things, I think, here that are important for each of us to learn about prayer. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to kind of walk through some of these, and I'm going to do it, I'm going to jump around a little bit, and it's on purpose, but I'll I'll kind of get to that as I go. But I want you to read with me first in verses two through four. So he's going to start off, he says, he says to them, when you pray, this is the things you're going to say. So at first, he starts with almost a quote. And if you'll notice, those of you that, that when you pray the Lord's Prayer, Right, we all we probably quote it right now. Most of us can quote it in King James. It is funny how that you know that's the thing that gets set. We quote it in King James, but if you notice in Luke, first and foremost, it's what? It's a little bit different. It's a little bit shorter, right? Most of us, when we quote the Lord's Prayer, you know, the Lord's. Oh, sorry, I was about to do Psalm Psalm twenty three, right? He says, pray in this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. Right? You notice in saying that, what's different in what I just read in verses two through four? It's a heck of a lot shorter, right? Luke seems to only take part of that. And what Luke does seem to do at times is he takes other parts of that and puts it throughout his, uh, his gospel. So before you go, whoa, 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 there's a lot missing here. There's a purpose, I think, behind part of what Jesus is doing here. And read with me. This is how he says it in Luke. He says, when you pray, say, Father, may your name be honored. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And do not lead us into temptation. You know, whenever I read this, when I look, and this is the first thing, I think four things that prayer should be based on what Jesus tells us in this passage. Four things is that first and foremost, prayer should be God-centered requests. God-centered requests. You know, it's fascinating to me, I think when Jesus is asked to teach on prayer, he makes the entirety of his prayer a series of what? What is everything that every part, uh, go back to that verse real quick, and you can put that back up. What is it that he does in each and every part of that? It's a what? It's a request, isn't it? It's an asking for something. There, and interestingly, in the time that Jesus says, this is how you should pray, there's no adoration. There's no praise. There's no sense of putting other things first. It jumps right into what? A request. May your kingdom come. It's a, in the Greek there, it is, it's, it's a requesting something. I want this to happen. May, your, kingdom, may your, your name be honored. May your kingdom come. It's almost childlike, isn't it? When a child comes to mom and dad asking for something, what do they do? They just simply, this is what I want. Mom, can I do this? Mom, dad, can I have this? Right? They come simply asking for the things that they want, the things that they need. Right? They don't come, oh, gracious mom and dad. 
Your name is so amazing. Now, if, they, if they're, like, like Alex said, they're a little manipulative. Sometimes they may do this. You're so wise, Mom. You're so gracious. You're so amazing. May I have some potato chips, please? No, right? Now, unless they're trying to manipulate, they didn't, no, they just come up and go, I want some potato chips. Excuse me? Can you ask a little bit? Can you ask, please? Can you say something, right? They just come asking. And it's interesting. Jesus says, how do you come to the Father? By what? Simply asking. Now, at the same time, however, notice, though, in the request, notice that each one of these, may your, may your, give us, forgive us, right? Do not lead us. All these things are requests to God, saying, we want this from you. But at the same time, the requests do understand something, unlike the child does often, and they're asking their snack requests, that the follower of Christ should have desires, I think, first and foremost, that are not merely, what, selfish. They're not merely requests that are focused on me alone. Whereas the child might come, I want this, I need this. Usually it has nothing to do with what? Mom or dad, right? It all has to do with me. But notice where Jesus, and it goes in every one of these, and it's not just for, through, the, through the first two, but everything, my requests, my asking of God should first and foremost for, be for the things that he wants to see, that he wants to provide. May your name be honored. May your kingdom come. And if you think about it, church, if God is truly who he says he is, if he truly is above all things, if he created all things, all things hold together in him, all things were made by the word of his mouth, there is nothing that happens outside of his knowing, outside of his control, outside of his power, that he is all powerful, that he is good, that he is loving, he is completely other than us, right? Then the thing that we should most seek for, the thing that we should most want, should be for what? For his glory, for his no, you know, I guess like his glory to be both known, but also to be shown. Remember, our chief, the chief end of man, our chief end is not to what? Have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's not what we exist for, is to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Our chief end is to do what? Glorify God and enjoy him forever. That is, that's one of the earliest confessions that we have of understanding what our relationship is to this holy God. We exist to glorify God. First and foremost, above all things. So I believe first, my, my asking and our asking should be rooted in seeking what brings about his glory, knowing that what brings about his glory is also going to be for what? Our best good. Our greatest good. And I ask, well, what does that look like? What does it look like to say, may your name be honored, may your kingdom come? We'll get there. Hold on to the end. We'll come back to that. But if you notice, not just in those first two things, may your name be honored, may your kingdom come, but notice even in the requests for ourselves, right, for not only his will, but we understand that even the personal requests have a, him as a focus. You need to be the one, God, who gives me my daily bread. I need to come to you understanding that it does not come from my effort. It does not come from my ability to gain, but it comes only because you provide it for me to have it. Father, you must bring forgiveness to me. Before I even worry about it, whether or not it's going to come to forgiveness for others, I need to understand who you are. I want to be like you, so I need your forgiveness. I need you to bring the restoration to me as I bring it to others, as we bring it to others. And finally, you must be the one who keeps me and protects me in temptation. Because the reality is, God, is that I'm not going to do it on my own. I'm weak. Anybody in here weak against temptation at times? I realize that every request that's being made here, notice it all comes from a realization of who God is and what he desires. And it's Jesus who's speaking these things, so it find, finds their foundation in him. I think prayer understands that every single step that you and I take is a step that we take only because of the grace of of our holy God. If it were not for his grace to give us the means to take the next step in life, it would not happen. 
And so Jesus, first, he wants us to ask freely. I believe as a child would even. But to understand that in the asking, we acknowledge our complete and utter dependence upon our Heavenly Father. And no matter what it is that we ask. First and foremost, our requests, our prayers should be God-centered requests. The second thing, I want to jump a little bit ahead, actually. And I think it'll make sense on why here. I want to see a foundation that Jesus ends with before going to this middle part. I want you to see a foundation of the asking that comes, or the type of thing that he says in the middle, but it comes from this. The second thing is this. Let me read in verses 11 through 13. He says, What father among you, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, although you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? I think the second thing is, it's not just that it's God-centered requests, the second is this, is that prayer should be secure in God's love. It should be secure in God's love. And I skipped to the end here because I want us to read the part in between with this in mind. And I think it goes back to that childlike request that he starts off with, this idea of understanding what it means to come. A child asks a parent for what they want and need. Why? Because the parent can do what? Can provide it, can give it, right? The child often cannot give it to themselves, cannot provide it for themselves. They come to the God, their parent. And, as we've said, because they believe that what? Because of their love for them, they'll do what? Provide it for them. A good father, Jesus says, delights in giving good things to their children. An earthly father, a good earthly father, delights in that. How many of you, on those of you who have kids, on Christmas morning, now it changes. When you start having kids, who typically almost is kind of enjoying the whole morning better and more? You might think the kids, I think you know, the kids enjoy it. They love ripping it open and whatnot. But things change when you become a parent on Christmas morning, doesn't it? What happens? Where does your enjoyment come as a parent? The gifts you receive from your kids or from your wife or your husband? It's often in what? Seeing them. When you provide them the thing that they've been longing for all year, right? And they rip that thing open and they go, oh my gosh, they just, that look on their face, the joy that comes with giving them exactly what they've been hoping for, right? Right? The giver, I think, often is the one that delights in things even more. The kids, they delight in it. What? Yay! All right, what's it? Right? I mean, I moved on. The, the young one, the, the two-year-old's doing what? Playing with the box, right? They're left with it. But you love it. You love seeing the delight on your children's face, right? You know what I take? I love taking our boys out. Uh, we call it our mandate, is that we, uh, we go out, take them out, and a lot of times we'll get a sweet treat. That's our thing. Out, we get a lot of times we'll get a donut, we'll try something different, whatever it may be. But you know, I enjoy it, don't get me wrong. I enjoy my donut, uh, you know, I love those things. But honestly, some of my enjoyment is going out and seeing them go, mm, you know, Pax just really loving that donut, like enjoying every moment of that sweet treat. I delight in their donut almost more than I, I mean, just as much or more than I delight in my donut. But Jesus says, What? How much more? I love that phrase. How much more does our Heavenly Father delight in giving us what we request? You see that? I love that. How much more? We come to our Heavenly Father who delights in giving us what we request. How unfortunate it is that so often we see God as a God with his arms crossed, with a scowl on his face, just waiting, like, how dare you ask me for that? You know, it's funny, but do we not do that often? Do we not think often that God does not want to truly give it to me, that I guess I have to kind of go in going, God, can I have it? Waiting for him to strike us for daring to ask for something. When... You know, that's not the, the father that Jesus portrays, is it? How much more is our request foundationally found in the fact that it is secure in God's love? That's who we're asking for. 
So I, I say that second point first because I, before we get to this next part, I want that to be understood and that foundation there as we come into our next part. Look with me in verses 5 through 10. After he did his, uh, you know, the, the Lord's Prayer, after he, he says, Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, let me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine has stopped here while on a journey. I have nothing to set before him. Then he'll reply from the inside, I love this, don't bother me. And that's how we feel at like one in the morning. Don't bother me. I don't want, I don't want my, you know, like, hey, I'm, I'm trying to sleep over here. I don't want that next, next to me in the bed. Like, shh, right? He said, don't bother me. I'm sleeping. The door's already shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. But I tell you, even though the man inside will not get up and give him anything because he's his friend, yet because of the first man's what? Sheer persistence. Can I have it? Can I have it? Can I have it? Can I have it? Poking, poking, prodding, right? The guy goes, fine. Just like a parent, fine. Here, here's the bread. Take it, please. Let me, let me go back to sleep. He will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I tell you, and he's saying, this is how you come to God. Doesn't it seem, seem kind of weird? I mean, this is one of those places I'm like, this seems kind of weird. Like he's using an example of like pestering your friend until he, he doesn't want to, but he gets out of bed and gives you what you need anyway. So therefore, this is how you come to God. Ask. And that's a present, a present continuous thing. Keep asking, and it'll be given to you. Keep seeking, and you will find. Pester, and you're knocking. Hello, I need some bread. I know you're in bed, but hello. Right? I mean, eventually, like, that's what he's saying. Keep, at, keep knocking. It's not a one-time thing. And the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Look at that. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. The, second, the third thing is not only should it be God-centered requests, not only is it securing God's love, but prayer should be persistent. He says, so therefore, Jesus tells us to be persistent in our requests, not to ask one time and let it go. Okay, God, I need this. Okay. How many of us do that? We ask one time, and that's it. Not afraid of pestering him. Not afraid of coming to him time and time and time again. Asking, 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 seeking, 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 knocking, knocking. God, 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 God. What? God. What do you want? God. Uh, okay, I need, I need, like he says, right? Jesus is saying, pester him. Ex not expecting anger, however. Why do I know not expecting anger? Because unlike me, who gets, yeah, at one in the morning, we're like, daddy, 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 daddy. I get that, and you're like, oh, because what? I'm an earthly father. I have a temper. But he says, remember, in 11 through 13, how much more, how much better is our heavenly father? He doesn't get pestered. He doesn't get overwhelmed. Not expecting anger because he's a good father. He's far better than I am as a father. And not thinking, well, he already knows my thoughts anyway, so I'm just not even gonna bother him about it, right? He knows all things. I'm not going to ask. You know, it's interesting. In this society, this is an honor-based society, right? If you had somebody show up at your home, doesn't matter what time it was, in a Jewish society, if somebody showed up at your home, what are you, in a sense, kind of required to do? You welcome them in. Does it matter if it's 1130 at night? No. And not only do you welcome them in, but you better be up doing what? Fixing them a meal, getting them something to eat, drink. If you go to a lot of Middle Eastern uh, <clears throat> households today, they'll still do this. You walk in, like, they'll make you a whole full meal, and they're like, I, I literally just ate. Like, look, I've got my food in my hand. I just ate. And they're like, no, you've got to keep eating. Do you need some tea? Do you need this? They, don't, and until you, like, stuff yourself. You're, like, this is part of the honor of society is I have somebody in my house, and I need something. But this person, they didn't even have the bread, so what do they do? They go to their neighbor who is also, since it's an honor society, what? Their honor is on the line. So the person that, that they showed up at their house, is, their honor is on the line to give them something. But when they come to their friend over here, who else's honor is on the line? The friend who should say, you're coming to me. I need to provide for you so you can provide for somebody else. That almost seems like, that, I don't even know that person, but it doesn't matter. The one knocking needed it, 
to show honor in providing, but also the one inside would show honor by granting the request. And let me ask you a question. When it comes to prayer, Jesus is using this. When it comes to prayer, whose honor is at stake? Both of us. Us and God. Yours is in seeking what is needed to provide. But notice, God's is also in supplying what is needed. God's honor is at stake in supplying what is needed. Jesus puts this upon the Father and saying, this is how things work. If Jesus says, this is how the Heavenly Father is, then what should we expect God to do and respond whenever we come to him asking for something? What, is this, what, is, what should we expect? That it would be given. I don't think a lot of us, we don't, we don't approach God this way. We give God an out so often. We are so quick, God, we pray for this thing, but if it's not your will, that you, I mean, do you ever notice that we always do that? We give God an out almost every single time. It's like, because we expect, I think we expect him not to answer. We expect maybe, maybe he'll do a miracle and then I'll be surprised about it. But how often do we come to him expecting him to answer? Do we? Or do we give him an out? Let me ask, do you pester God for what is needed? Do you keep at him poking until you hear a response? If not, should you? Should you start? But one last thing. I think we skipped it earlier because it's back in verse 13. There's one other thing. Not only is God's, should prayer be for God-centered requests, not only should it be secure in his love, not only should it be persistent, but look in verse 13 again. He says, if then you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give what? The Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Now, it's interesting. This is another place that Luke differs from Matthew. Matthew says, give good gifts. Luke puts it as that your prayer should be persistent, not only persistent, but persistent for the Holy Spirit. You know, it's interesting. Jesus adds this last part to the end and at first glance, I think it seems a little out of place, doesn't it? It seems like it doesn't really fit with everything else he's been talking about. Nowhere previous is there any mention of the Spirit being asked for. But all of a sudden, Jesus just kind of puts it in right here at the end. And it's kind of like, oh, what, what does that have to do with anything? It, but notice, in all of these requests, they all lead up to this reality. Asking that our Heavenly Father might give the Spirit to those who ask persistently for him to work. So I ask you a question, like what does the Holy Spirit have to do with this section about asking, about prayer? I believe that it's related actually all the way back to the very beginning of this, this passage. I believe it's related to a question that many of us were asking we said earlier <clears throat> when we start this is what does it look like to ask the Father that his kingdom would come, that his name would be honored and his kingdom come. I think the, the question of what does the Spirit have to do with this has everything to do with answering the question, what does it look like to have his kingdom come and his name be honored? These things are bookended, and they have everything to do with what's in between today. I think it has everything to do with us sitting here in this room today. And I want to take a step back and explain what I mean by that. I'm going to take a drink because I'm really thirsty. And i got a lot to say. Let me take you all the way back, okay? All the way back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. God created everything, and he put man, and he created mankind on the sixth day to be the pinnacle of his creation, right? And where did he place man in chapter 2? He placed him in a garden, in Eden. Right? He created all the world for man and he placed Adam and Eve in Eden. For what purpose? What was the purpose of Eden? To be a place where what would happen? God and man would fellowship. That God's presence would be with his people. Right? You remember? It says that God would walk with Adam. He would be in his presence, among him. What was the purpose of Eden? Presence. Walking with God. But what happens in chapter 3? 
it's lost. The presence is lost. And not only is something happening to creation, but man and woman are done what in relation to the garden? They are what? Kicked out of the garden. Away and blocking the way on the way out is a what? There's a cherubim, a heavenly being with a what? A flaming sword, right? Keeping them from coming back in. The way is shut, right? The way is shut. But God, fast forward a little bit. When God calls his people into the land, he brings them to Sinai. He gives them instructions in Exodus to build a what? A tabernacle. To build a place where what would occur? The presence of God would come down and be in that place and be in the midst of a people. Through the sacrificial system, God provided a way For them to, Leviticus starts off with the words, for anyone who wishes to come near, bring the coming near thing to draw near. That's basically how Leviticus starts. God gives a way to come near, to come into the presence. And it's interesting, if you look at the whole entire, like of the, the temple, you've got this holy of holies, you've got these places coming just inside. You just step in just inside the temple. What's right there? Anybody knows what's right there at the very beginning inside, just in, stepping inside? It's an altar. And what is happening on that altar at all times? There's something, well, the sacrifices do happen, but what? There's a burning. There is a fire that's always going up at the entrance of the tent. And if you were to stand there, if you're standing at the entrance of the tent and you're to look into, there's an inner inner room inside that where the holy place is and the holy of holies is. And anybody know what's actually on the curtains of the outside curtains? If you were to look at it, you know what you'd see? Anybody know? There would be two of something, cherubim. So if you're standing at the, 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 the focus and you're looking in, what are you seeing? You're first seeing fire, and behind that you're seeing cherubim. And you know what's on the inside of that curtain? The inside curtain of that? More cherubim. You know what's on the inside? And you know what's in there? A smaller altar. That's the altar of incense. You know what's inside of that curtain, that second curtain? The Ark of the Covenant. You know what's on the top of the Ark of the Covenant? Take a guess. Two cherubim. And what happens between those two cherubim? On the mercy seats where the presence of God would come, the blood would be applied, the mercy seat would be where the presence of God would be in between those cherubim. What is the temple to be a picture of? Eden. The temple, the tabernacle is a mini Eden on earth. The one that was lost by Adam and Eve, but God has provided a place for man to come back into and be in the presence of God once again. Yet, what happens? Fast forward, what happens? The people rebel. They want nothing to do with Yahweh God. And what happens to the glory of God? We talked about this a week or two ago. The Shekinah glory, Ezekiel sees what? It goes up from it, and it goes over the Mount of Olives and disappears. But then what happens? Come John chapter 1. The Word was with God. The Word was God, right? And what happens in John 1, 14? The Word became what? Flesh. The eternal Son of God, the glory of God himself, became flesh. That word, flesh, is not flesh, actually. It's not this. It's the word tabernacled, tent. He became a tent. In other words, he became the new tabernacle. God, the Son, came down to be a new tabernacle. And it says, we beheld his, anybody? Glory. What is John wanting you to understand about Jesus? That he is the new, what? Temple. That he is the glory of God. That God, Emmanuel, which means God with us. God's presence. The glory is walking around in this man, Jesus Christ, walking around teaching how to pray, how to come to the Heavenly Father. Who would know better than the one who's been in the presence eternally with his Father? Would know. But not only that, what did the glory that was in Jesus do after the cross and the resurrection a few weeks later, 40 days later? 
he went away. He says, I must go away, but it's better for you. Why? That I might send another one who is just like me, who is of the same substance as me, that I go away so that he might come to you. And Paul picks up on it. Peter picks up on it. And he calls each one of us, as a body of believers, the what of the Holy Spirit? The temple of the Holy Spirit. The glory of God resides where? In us. Now, interestingly, what was happening when the temple was on earth? It was a mini what? Eden, a picture of Eden. Then you get the second temple in Jesus, who is the fullness of God, the fullness of the kingdom, a mini Eden in within himself, but he goes away. And what does he do? He sends the Holy Spirit to live where? In his people, those who call upon Jesus as their Savior, as their Lord, and they follow after him, the glory of God is in the people of God, not in this building. Please stop singing songs that ask the Spirit to show up. You don't understand the Scripture. If you have to ask him to show up, then he's not here anyway. He ain't showing up unless he's in his people. Okay, side note. But what is among each of us sitting here today if we call upon Christ? The what? The presence. In understanding that we are the temple of God, we understand that God's presence is here. We are in the church, not this place, but the people where God resides. And if it's where God resides, then we are a mini what? Think about it. A mini Eden. Among his people, we are a mini Eden in this world that is so corrupt. The spirit at work in us to live as though Christ is king, as though his rule matters, to live as though Eden were true here and in our midst, giving, caring, worshiping, honoring, showing mercy, showing grace. That is what this is about. If I want to pray in persistently, God, may your kingdom come, I'm asking what? We are asking what? that his kingdom would grow in us, not just somewhere out there that he would just do things, but that he would change us to live as a people that live radically different than what the world would see. When we reach out and we take care of a brother or sister when they're in need of something, like the Testins, and how the church has come together to provide for their need as they are in that for this surgery. When somebody is sick and you bring them a meal and you take care of them. When you encourage someone with the word and you bring that to life. When you, when you repent, when you fall short of something and there's repentance, not only to others around you, but to your children. When you wrong them, you say, son, I need you to forgive me because I did wrong to you. To your three-year-old, do you repent of that? Do we see people living differently and changing in these little pockets? I, I kind of imagine it's like, this is just how, as Christopher imagines it, it's like where the people of God are and as we live out what he calls us to do and we persistently ask, Holy Spirit, be in us. Please work in us. We ask you, we seek that to presence. We seek that to happen. Come on, let it happen. When we see that, we radically live differently. We change. We're not what the world will see. We are not what we once were. We are new in Christ. We are a new creation. And we live it out amongst each other. And you know what happens to the kingdom? In us, it grows. We see the presence of God manifest itself in us by the way that we live. And when we do this, we see the pockets of the kingdom grow. But here's the reality, church. It's not about keep, keep, keeping that presence in here, is it? It's about bringing that presence, the presence of the Spirit, out to wherever we go. Bringing it out to those who need it. And about bringing them into the presence to grow the kingdom. 
not just amongst ourselves, but to see the kingdom grow. You want to see his kingdom come, church? Ask persistently for the Holy Spirit to empower us to live as kingdom people, as people transformed into something different. Unashamed of his gospel, unashamed to tell other people that this is the only way to life. If you do not trust it, then you will perish. There is no other name under heaven which man must be saved, and that is Jesus Christ. There is nothing else. Are you ashamed of his gospel, or do you tell him others about it and say, this is life? Do you bring others into the presence? This is about what our body and our community can be if we're persistent in our seeking our Father's glory and his kingdom and his righteousness, knowing that if we seek those things, what? All of the other things will be added to us as well. Amen? And I gotta tell you, church, I will not concede the battle. I will not concede the battle as I look around our culture, and it's easy to look around and say that Satan is winning, that the battle belongs to him. That is a falsehood. The battle belongs to the Lord. Do not fret for knowing that I have overcome the world, Jesus says. Do not look at the news. Do not believe that everything has fallen apart and there is no hope. I believe that Jesus' church will be built upon the truth that he is the Christ and the gates of hell will not overcome that. Revival, church, is possible. Revival in our country, revival, and it starts in and among us that we are willing to live differently and asking persistently that his spirit would live among us and that he will take care of the rest. We start here, and we will see things transformed. I guarantee it. Because my God, our God, is stronger, and he is living in us, and he wants to empower us for his glory. Amen? Let us be a people that persistent for the Holy Spirit to work. That we might bring his presence, not only from this building, but to bring it out to our neighbors, to everyone we interact with. And the world goes, whoa. God is in this place. And that they would want to be in that presence. Amen? Let's pray.